as we continue on with our focus of honoring our graduates and the challenge that it is every year to think of something original to say that applies not just to our graduates but to the life of the church as a whole, um, I couldn't help but just think to us this morning that where we'll end up being in God's Word, Philippians chapter 3, looking at verses 12 through 16 this morning, I'm asking the question, what will you do to live a life that matters? What will you do to live a life that matters? And that's a question I feel that no matter where we are in life, no matter what we have going on, it's a worthy question to ask. Is this pursuit I'm after? Is this hobby that I am a part of? Are those things that will bring worth or that really matter in the end? And I think Paul does a great job of answering that question for us as we look at Philippians chapter 3 this morning. Now we are jumping in mid-thought to Paul's letter, and so there's always some challenges with that. And so I just want to give you kind of a synopsis of where we have been in Philippians to where we will be here this morning, in case you're unfamiliar. Paul is writing to the church of Philippi. And one of the prominent issues that the church was facing in the culture of its day was there were some teachers out there that were trying to convey that when you come to Christ, that you will no longer deal with sin. You will be perfect. I don't know who could teach that. They're better salesmen than I could ever be. Or maybe they were never really married, and so they had nobody to really point out their flaws. <laughs> but regardless, Paul is addressing this very issue in the life of the church. And so that is why when we read through these verses, we will find why Paul is saying, not that I'm already perfect, not that I've already obtained this, but I keep pressing on. Or in essence, what he's saying is, what are you doing with your life that matters? What are you chasing after? What are you seeking after? And I think in some ways, we are all in pursuit of something, whether it's from the very beginning when you were a baby or a toddler. There's probably a phrase that your parents heard you say often, and that was the phrase, I do it. I do it. If you haven't been around a two-year-old very recently, come to my house, you'll hear it all the time. No, no, no. I do it. Okay, that's great, but I'm going to clean the toilet with the chemicals, all right? You're not doing it, or I do it. All right, that's great, but these are sharp knives. You're not going to just do it by yourself in the kitchen, cutting all these vegetables, right? And at the end of the day, the thing that we are often pursuing in those instances is that of independence. We're trying to find those things that will bring worth in our minds, developing new skills every single day. And so to our seniors who we are celebrating the accolades of what you have accomplished in your life, they are awesome. And you are stepping into a new phase of life today, this year, this summer, this fall, wherever. But there are some who are sitting here this morning who are retired or are close to it. And you might be thinking, well, this message clearly is not for me. But I think at each stage we at one time I've asked the question, is what I'm pursuing matters? And I think that enters even into our retirement life. Now, some of us are much further away from that than others. So, but the question still remains, is what I'm pursuing matters? Is my end goal, is my purpose in whatever it is going to glorify God. And so as we look at Philippians chapter 3 this morning, we're going to seek to answer that question by seeing three different pursuits of how Paul is going to address that for us. And so number one we're going to see this morning is in verse 12, is that we need to live our life with passion. And Paul says that in verse 12. He says, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have obtained." And so as Paul is addressing the church of Philippi, he's saying, you need to live your life with passion. 
And I was trying to think of what would be a pretty good idea for us as Michiganders. What would that idea of a passion being so known or so contagious? And I thought, you know, recently, Detroit Lions, whether good or bad in your mind, mostly bad probably, if they won the Super Bowl next year, I'm pretty sure the people of Michigan would be so absorbed within their passion that even if you weren't a Detroit Lion fan, you'd get caught up in that, right? Apparently, we don't have a lot of football people here this morning. <laughs> or you're not Detroit Lion fans because you know just how bad they truly are. But when we think about the idea of passion, it's easy for us at times to get caught up in it. Even if we don't really care, if somebody is truly passionate about whatever, you can get excited alongside of them, right? And so if the Detroit Lions won the Super Bowl this next time, I think even if you weren't a Lions fan, you'd be pretty excited. Because you guys get pretty excited about when Michigan beats Ohio State. So, and I could care less because I'm from New York, and so we don't have any good teams out there. So don't think, well, Pastor Ryan, you're obviously an Ohio State fan, blah, blah, blah. No, I got married into that cult, and so <laughs> it's bad. But in verse 12, Paul says, not that I've already obtained this. And so what is this thing that Paul is trying to obtain? Or what is he pursuing? What is he passionate about? And we've already talked a little bit about this, but he's seeking that full maturity in Christ. And ultimately, that can only be found when we are with Christ into eternity. When we have entered into life eternal with him. When we exit out of this life. And so Paul was helping us to see that this is going to be an ongoing process. And if you want a good churchy term for this process, it's called progressive sanctification. It's this work that began at the moment of salvation for us and is constantly ongoing throughout our life until we meet Christ in eternity. And so as Paul was talking, he says, not that I've already attained this or already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. So what was Paul's central focus? What was the passion in which he was going after? And his central focus in life was to know Jesus and bring others to know him. That was Paul's central focus. And you go, well, Pastor Ron, how do you know this? Well, because in you, as you read the life of Paul, Paul was entering into death's doors. He knew that death was coming into his peripheral very soon. And one of the things that he said to his friends was, when you come to visit me, bring me my journals, bring me my notes, bring me the scriptures so that I may know Jesus more. He might say, well, Paul, you're about to die. Why does it matter? You're going to be with Christ. And the reason why it mattered to him was because his central focus, his central passion was to know Jesus and to bring others to know him as well. And so that should cause us to pause this morning and ask the question, what am I passionate about? What am I pursuing? Because Paul would write in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. What is your passion? What will your life be known by? How long will your achievements, whatever they may be, be known for? I think a good perspective for us here this morning was actually made by Alistair Begg recently. He made this statement, you will not sit in heaven wishing you worked more. You'll not sit in heaven wishing you worked more. Man, if I only put an extra five hours at work every week, I would have had so much more money. And we're not going to talk about that in heaven. That's not going to be our central focus. That's not our passion as believers. What we will do probably in some moments, or probably wish we would have invested more spiritually in our lives and the lives around us. So what is your passion? What is it that you are pursuing? Because our world is riddled with a pursuit of money, extracurricular activities, hobbies, etc., But we are all left with the question, does this stuff really matter? At the end, does your, does your golf handicap truly matter? Does your video game score really matter? 
Does your accolades of however many letters after your birth-given name matter? And I think at the end of the day, the question really needs to be, what is it that I'm passionate about? And how do we develop this passion that we're talking about here in verse 12? Well, number one is that we have to understand that passion is caught by doing. I don't know if you've ever been around somebody who is passionate about something, but you kind of got caught up in it. How many of you ever been around somebody, you're like, man, they're so passionate about it, I want to do it myself. And you start doing it, and then you kind of quickly stop doing it because it dwindles, and you're like, okay, this isn't as cool as they made it up here. Right, you might be watching sports on TV and go, wow, those people are so amazing what they do. You know what, I'm going to go pick up a football, and I'm going to make the NFL. And you go try and quickly fade away. Or I enjoy watching hockey, and I go, man, I bet you I can do what they do. And as soon as a 250-pound defenseman checks me into the wall and all my bones recover, I'm probably going to go, you know what, it's cool to watch, but that's about it. This is not for me. Right? And so we have to understand that passion is caught by doing. So at some point, our passion needs to be rooted in the Word of God when we talk about what Paul is talking about. We have to have a plan. We've got to read it. We've got to study it. And a great place to start, if you've never started in your own life yet, is maybe to pick up a proverb and read a proverb a day. There's 31 of them, which means that within a given month, you'll read through the book of Proverbs in one month by reading one every single day. Or you could start with the book of John and read one chapter. There's 28. So that means you have a couple of days of leniency if you miss one or forget. But you can read the book of John in one month every single day. But you got to have a plan. you got to have something to get caught in so it doesn't just dwindle away like so many of our passions often do. But a passion that truly gets caught, if it's going to stay, it needs to get cultivated. And for us as believers, our passion is cultivated by learning. And so we can't just stop by just saying, oh, I'm just going to read my Bible. Man, grab a tool to help you develop that, to cultivate that whether it's a cross-reference guide, a map, a concordance, something that's going to push you deeper. You know, one of the greatest privileges we have here at Berean is an awesome library that has those resources. So what I would encourage you is go to the library as soon as we're done. Grab one of those tools and use it. Freak out the librarians. Empty out the whole section. That would be awesome. Not that I'm trying to sabotage them, but I think... I think when we utilize the things that God has given us, people get excited. You know what might happen? We might have to go, all right, we're going to have to put some budget more towards tools because people are using them so much. Or go out and buy your own. But cultivate it, develop it, grow it within your life. And then lastly, we need to have passion that is cemented by accomplishment. Passion that is cemented by accomplishment. And when we talk about spiritual accomplishments, that takes all sorts of forms, all sorts of ways to view it, right? Whether it be somebody that you share Christ with and they come to know to a saving knowledge of faith, that is an accomplishment. Or if you are somebody who read and memorized 600 some verses in your lifetime, that's an accomplishment. All those things cement in us a desire, a passion that will grow and be contagious around other people. So we got to live out what we're reading, what we're studying, and share it with people around us. Man, write down a goal that you're going to live out this week and see how God grows within you a deeper passion for him, something that you're able to gauge it by. But as we live with that passion, why does that matter so much? Well, let me give you an example. Somebody might come up to me this morning and say, you know what, Pastor Ryan, I'm so passionate about crocheting. In case nobody knows what crocheting is, that's the whole, you make things with fabric or yarn and you make hats and hand mittens and all those type of things. Somebody might come up to me and go, Pastor Ryan, I'm so passionate about crocheting. You really need to get into this thing. I'm going to say, I'm probably going to say, no, that's okay. I'm sorry. And not to offend any of my crocheters out here this morning. But it's just not something that interests me. But you know what? If you're passionate enough about it and really develop a need for why it's so important in my life, you might get me. 
Because we know that as we are around people who are passionate, who are able to articulate reasons why something like that matters so much, it will cause us to dive deeper into seeing why they're so passionate. And you might get caught up in it. And we might have to be doing donation bins of all these hats and mittens that we are now going to have from all of you crocheting people out there. But we all don't want to be somebody like an Eeyore when it comes to our walk with Jesus. You know, you might go up to somebody, you know what? Following Jesus is great. Wouldn't you love to be a follower of Jesus? It's so exciting. Right? Nobody wants to be around an Eeyore. But also nobody wants to be around that person. It's like, you know what? You want to learn about Jesus? Let me talk about Jesus. Jesus is so awesome. He's so great. And easy there. Cut the coffee. Cough, cut the caffeine out. Let's take it down a few notches, right? You don't want to be around somebody who's passionate and obnoxious. No finger pointing. Right? There's a balance that we have to strike. We can't be so passionate about Jesus that everybody's like, man, I, I can't wait to be depressed like you. You don't want to be around people that are so passionate that you're like, man, I don't know how much caffeine you got to get to get you that level of lover of Jesus. But we have to find the balance. And so where is that? Well, it comes in our humility. It comes in our humility, which Paul talks about in verse 13. We need to live a life that is humble, which is why Paul says, live your life with humility. Verse 13 Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Now, let us not forget that the apostle Paul was renowned, was applauded for a lot of his accomplishments that he achieved in his lifetime. In case you forgot what some of those were, just hop up to verse 4 of chapter 3, and we're going to see that he humbly put them down. Lay them aside, he said in verse 4, I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul lists all these accomplishments that he has in his lifetime. And it's not that they weren't important or they weren't good. They were in good of themselves. But he says all of those things matter, not a lick of He surrendered them all. And why did he surrender them all? Well, it comes in verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Essentially what Paul is saying is without Christ... No accomplishment has permanent significance. Without Christ, no accomplishment has permanent significance. People would have looked at the life of Paul and said, man, he's got it all together. He's done so much in his life. That is something to be proud of. But Paul says, all those things mean nothing if I don't know Jesus. Yes, they can earn me lots of cool things in life, but at the end of the day, if I'm without Christ, they're all going to burn up one day. Essentially what Paul would be saying to us here today is, my high school diploma, it's rubbish. My college master PhD degree, rubbish. My career path, my goals, rubbish. All this is lost in comparison to knowing Jesus Christ. See, Paul had a singular focus that led him to conclude that in life, coming to know Jesus is the most important accomplishment any human being can achieve. But it doesn't stop there by just coming to know Jesus. We got to go deeper. We got to know him more. So what does that mean for us here this morning? Well, with humility, we can see that how God equips and leads us to live a life for his glory. What I want you to hear this morning is if you're an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer, a high school graduate. All those things are awesome. But glorify God in those things. Whether you're a stay-at-home mom 
or a wife who stays at home. Glorify God in that position. What we do needs to be done with purpose. And I just want to take a moment to pause because our world says that if you don't have a career or a job, your life doesn't mean much. That's not what the God of the Bible says. Your value is found, number one, being made in the image of God. But number two, your value is found in Jesus Christ. So if you're a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home wife, there's great value in that. There's great worth in that. Don't forget that. Because there's many people around the world who don't get the privilege of a parent who can stay home and invest in their life every single day. What we do with our life matters. And so we must live our life then with purpose. Paul says in verse 14, I press on towards the goal for the prize, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus And let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. So what is our purpose in life? Well, our purpose comes from the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 28. Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So what Jesus and Paul is trying to encourage us with here this morning is that no matter where God leads you, if God is leading you to that position, that place, that house, that family, whatever it is, glorify him in that pursuit. Be in a place where people can know Christ. I don't want you to hear me say this morning, don't get a degree or don't get this job because it's pointless because that's not what Paul, that's not what we are trying to say. We need godly men and women in various careers because how else can some of those people come to know Christ if there are no believers in those positions? Also, I don't want you to sit here as a retiree and think, well, I am free of this and this doesn't apply to me at all. Because it's not what Paul says. Paul is actually saying, you know what? There are no old people in the work of Christ. Because we're all learning. We're all growing. We're all developing. So praise the Lord here that there is nobody who is old in our congregation. You just have different colored hair. And a lot more life wisdom. It just means that God has a redeployment for you. God is just reassigning you to a new deployment to serve him. Praise the Lord for that. Which means then that your worth in Christ is not dependent, older saints, upon your physical ability. Your physical capacity does not determine your worth. What determines your worth is how you invest what God has given to you your skills, your talents for his kingdom. You heard from some of our graduates how you have invested in their lives immeasurably. Praise the Lord for that. So what if you can't do what you used to be able to do? You can still pray. You can still encourage. You can still do a lot of things. You can just sit and listen to some young whippersnappers talk about whatever. They need your wisdom. We need your wisdom. Young people, you have a lot of physical capabilities, but your worth is not found in those things either. Your worth is found in your pursuit of Christ. Let's remember those important truths this morning because Paul is saying we're all in pursuit of something, but I am pressing on towards the goal of Christ. I am pushing on to the purpose to know Jesus and to make others know him more. So we need to ask the question, does my purpose get accomplished by what I am pursuing? And am I passionately pursuing Christ in this endeavor? And that fits everybody's category. So whether you're a stay-at-home mom, an engineer, a lawyer, a doctor, somebody who works in a factory, a retiree, or whatever your title is, asking the question, can I pursue Christ in this? and make others know him. 
Hopefully the answer is yes. This is why Paul then says in verse 15, we need to ask God for direction, for wisdom. Let any of those who are mature think this way. If anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. So what we do as we wait for his response to that prayer, hold true to the gospel. That's what he says in verse 16. Only let us hold true to what we have obtained. Be faithful and let your purpose as a Christian show in the waiting period. So as we wrap up this morning, we think about where are our next steps, where we go from here, can I just encourage you to maybe ask a dangerous question this morning? And that is, is my career, my job, or my retirement where God wants me right now? Is my career, my job, where God wants me? For some of us here this morning, it might be, yes, that's exactly where God wants you. So praise the Lord for that. But for some of you, you might be having that, that moment of dissatisfaction, and that might be God trying to get a hold of your attention and saying, you know what, I want you to change whatever it is so that your purpose can be more fully realized. And I say that's a dangerous question because it might mean it might be very costly. It might change some things about your life. But let me tell you, the obedience to the God of heaven is far more important than a monetary dollar amount in your life. Or we might be asking the question of, is my study the pursuit that God wants me to pursue as we are talking to our graduates? And so what I want to say is, don't be afraid to seek the advice, the counsel of people who love and care about you deeply. And young people, don't be afraid to ask old people what they think. I mean, wiser people, what they think. <laughs> if God is leading, God will open the door for you. So that's our question for this week. It's a dangerous one. It might mean some discomfort. It might mean some changes are in order. But you know what? God will sustain and provide if he is calling. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for waking us up, bringing us here to a church that loves you, loves your word, and seeks to live it out in their daily pursuits. And Father, I pray for each one of us here as we ask the question that we've been talking about this morning. Lord, open our eyes to where it is that you are asking of us to go and what it is that you're asking us to pursue. And Lord, things need to change in our lives that we would be bold and courageous to do those even today. And Father, we pray these things in the precious name of Christ. Amen.